in The Twice Dead King, Rain, Nate Crowley weaves a compelling tale that takes story elements from the classics of the real world and sets them in something that's very much at home in the 40k universe. I'm Philip from Manning the Fort, and today I want to talk about why I may have a new favorite 40k novel. I'm going to try not to bury the lead here. Nate Crowley has written a book that is simultaneously entertaining and thought-provoking in terms of the 40k universe. I listened to the audiobook version, and Richard Reed's narration is amazing, giving distinction and personality to a species that is, by definition, pretty monotonous. I do have affiliate links in the description where you can get the audiobook on Audible, and if you're not yet an Audible member, there is a link to sign up. Rain tells a story that should be very familiar to just about anyone watching this video. It's the story of the Odyssey, the Greek epic following the travels of Odysseus after the Trojan War. Even if you don't think you're familiar with the Odyssey, you probably are. It's one of the most influential stories in the history of Western literature. If you've consumed any media centered around the hero's journey, and you have, it has roots that go back to the Odyssey. Not only does Rain take a lot from the Odyssey, Nate Crowley wants us to know it. Polyphemus, Tiresias, the Lystragonians, even the name of the Ithacus dynasty itself are directly lifted from the classic tale. While a lot of authors borrow from the story, few are as upfront about it, and I found that level of honesty from Crowley kind of endearing. I'm honestly a little embarrassed I didn't see it earlier in Ruin beyond simply recognizing a few names. There are also echoes of another classic in the story of Altics. The Aeneid by the Roman poet Virgil tells the story of Aeneas, one of the survivors of Troy leaving his destroyed homeland to found a new kingdom for his people. Should sound familiar. With all that said, Rain is still very much a Warhammer 40k novel. It's pulpy and full of the over-the-top battles and ridiculous technology that we've come to expect from the grim darkness of the far future. I'm not going to give a blow-by-blow -blow retelling of the story, and we'll try to avoid too many major spoilers. Rather, I want to touch on some of the elements of Rain and why I thoroughly enjoyed them. When the twice-dead king, Rain, begins, Ultix is the new dynast of the Ithacus dynasty, just as Odysseus was the king of Ithaca. The Ultix we got to know in Ruin is steeped in the traditions of the Necron Tyr and the Necrons, a society where absolute rulers are the order of the day, and it's a seemingly universal belief that by will, Heka, alone, the king can change reality itself. Ultix is a king on the run. The Imperium of Man is pursuing his ragtag fleet, and the Ithacans are barely managing to keep ahead of their would-be destroyers. It reads a lot like Battlestar Galactica, and it should, given that Battlestar Galactica also borrows heavily from the Odyssey. The only danger isn't from outside, however. It's well established in Ruin that the Flayer Curse is a real problem for the Ithacus dynasty. It claimed the crown world, and is a ticking clock for the Razor of Seda, arguably the most important military asset of the Ithacan dynasty. Beyond that, we were shown hints in Ruin, and again early in Reign, that Ultix fears the possibility of the Flayer curse within himself, and very much conflates it with the Dysphorak, which he has not vanquished as completely as he would like to believe. In the ancient Greek stories like the Odyssey, the heroes often had tragic flaws, things innate to their character that would ultimately bring about their downfall. For Odysseus, it was hubris, a mix of pride, arrogance, and stubbornness. One could argue that the Necrons as a whole are afflicted by severe hubris, and their kings most of all. For Ultix, the paranoia ingrained in the Necrons gets turned up to 11. With the Imperium on his heels and the Flayer Curse threatening to eat his band of refugees from within, he leans on the traditions of ruling through fear. The fear of the king's wrath must eclipse fear of the threats to the dynasty as a whole. Beyond that, Ultix no longer has his most trusted advisors in reign, the fragments of his own consciousness that once cohabitated his mind. He believes a Necron king can only trust himself, and as annoying as he often found them, Ultix was able to have both a council of advisors and maintain the extremely narcissistic tendencies of Necron royalty. The Ultix we see early in Reign throws away much of the growth and self-realization that he achieved in Ruin. The compassion that he displayed in the first book, a true rarity amongst his people, is quickly discarded in favor of doing things the way he believes a king should behave, the way Unas behaved. 
Call it what you like, power corrupting, the weight of the crown, or something else, but the way Ultix changes once he takes on the mantle of Dynast is very interesting to read. In the Greek tragedies, the protagonist's flaw inevitably led to their downfall. Like I said, I'll leave some of the major plot points out of this video, but I'm already thinking I need to do some more spoiler-heavy stuff down the road. If you're interested in seeing that when it comes out, you can subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. One of the things that both Nate Crowley and Robert Rath have done with their respective books about the Necrons is give new perspectives on the Imperium of Man. Humanity to the Necrons is simply one flavor of the unclean, a title they give to all organic life. Through The Twice Dead King, Nate Crowley has shown us that their loathing for anything organic is in part driven, as most hatreds are, by fear. The organic life of the galaxy is a reminder of their own loss, and contact with truly living beings threatens to awaken the Dysphorac in Ultix on multiple occasions. If you haven't seen it, I did a whole video on the concept of the Dysphorac, which I have linked in the description below. In brief, however, it's essentially the part of the Necron's consciousness that remembers being alive, the lizard brain part of them that can cause a wild panic when it takes control and a Necron suddenly realizes that they can't breathe, they don't have a face, and are essentially no longer what they once were. The descriptor I like to use is full body phantom limb syndrome turned up to max volume. That explains some of the Necron's hatred for organic life in general, but let's focus specifically on us, humanity. We've known for years what most of the other sentient species in the galaxy think of humanity. For a long time though, the Necrons were just this force of sheer alien malevolence, the proxy of the undead in fantasy universes meant to invoke atavistic terror. Like I said in previous videos, the Necrons have become more fully developed as a sentient species in recent years, and that includes a deeper look into how they view the human race. Ultix, with the benefit of a Necron's ridiculous lifespan, sees humanity as a blip in time. A species that has forged and lost multiple galactic empires in the relative blink of an eye when compared to the eons-long rule of his own people. His view of humanity is heavily flavored with the aloof superiority typical to the long-lived races toward humanity in any fantasy setting. He dismisses the Emperor of Man as a thuggish mystic, and the Imperium as a cult of war living in a shell of its own brief glory days. Then we have Ultix's encounter with the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines. He had seen them once before during his time on Antikef, but in Rain we get more about how he views humanity's most elite forces. Ultix finds it almost impossible to view them as human. His description of how the Astartes are made is grotesque and brutal, but rather accurate. Here is what Ultix sees in the Angels in Carmine. These were monsters. Multiple redundant organs had been crammed into their bodies. Their skeletons had been shattered and rebuilt time and time again, simply to allow more flesh to be stacked on top. And they were riddled throughout with foreign matter. Bolts, splints, cables, and banks of half-functioning machinery, like the tendrils of parasites. As a longtime Space Marine player myself, I can't help but see that as essentially all true, and it paints quite a stark contrast to the heroic shining beacons of transhumanity that seem to be the common perception. There are certainly other examples of the darker side of the Astartes, but it's always interesting to see the perspective of another sentient race. From the top, I've made it very clear that I really enjoyed the Twice Dead King reign. Paired with Ruin, I really think it may have supplanted The Infinite and the Divine as my favorite story set in the 40k universe. It's certainly top three. There are plenty of great stories out there, but they tend to deal with known quantities. We as consumers of the lore know generally what Space Marines or Imperial Guard or the Mechanicus are like. Don't get me wrong, there are great stories about all of those, but there's something about getting to see the traits of his species developed in real time that's incredibly appealing to someone like me who's been around this hobby for more than two decades. The other thing that really sets apart my upper echelon of 40k books is making characters believable, if not relatable. I've praised Aaron Dembski Bowden's writing of the Space Marines before for this exact reason, and Nate Crowley has done a great job with an even more alien protagonist, literally. The nods and winks to people who paid attention in Western Lit courses in school are just kind of a cherry on top, frankly. 
One of my favorite classes in college was science fiction as literature. In that course, I learned how sci-fi as a genre can open up possibilities to tell old stories in new ways that books rooted in the real world simply can't, and it makes me very happy to see writers doing that in my favorite fandom. Black Library has always had some great writers, and there are some real gems that are decades old, but it seems to me that some of the authors who have been writing in recent years have really pushed the 40k universe and its stories beyond a companion piece for a tabletop game and into a subgenre all its own. This is not my first video about the Twice Dead King series, and I sincerely doubt it'll be my last. There's still a lot to unpack about what's revealed from the past of the Necrons, more about the Flayed Ones, and Necron society in general, but I wanted to avoid spoiling too much for those who haven't read it yet. An earlier video where I take a look at how Nate Crowley portrays the mind, or minds, of Ultix should be displayed on screen now. Until next time, may your Hekka remain strong, and thanks for watching.